Hi everyone, in today's video, I'm going to be doing a follow-up on the housing market. The last time I made a video on this topic, I had the conclusion that the fundamentals of the housing market are extremely shaky, and I continue to believe this to be true. That being said, prices are likely to stay firm in the background because of a very key set of dynamics that are not related to a strong economy, but rather coming down to three supply constraints, which I'll talk about today. I'll walk you through some of the data that I'm looking at when it comes to the consumer and housing, and you can make decisions for yourself on the health of this market. If you're new to my channel, my name is Larry, and I talk about macro topics related to the US and China. In my Substack letters that I send out Monday through Thursday for subscribers, I dive deeper into intraday, intermediate term, and long-term investing ideas. Make sure to subscribe below for the latest updates. I also post updates on Instagram and Twitter, links below. First off, let's start with the big picture concept for consumer health. According to Redfin, a staggering 40% of renters think that they'll never be able to own a home. This statistic is up from 27% last year. So right from the start, we can see that even if housing prices continue to go up, the future of housing can't possibly be overly optimistic if you have the demand side of the equation withering away like this, slowly but surely. Now I did some math and I found out that about 44 million Americans rent rather than own. So if 40% of people don't plan to buy a house within this demographic, you have 16 to 20 million people who may potentially never be in the market to own a home. That's a pretty significant number of people who might otherwise be buyers. Now over time, because of inflation, pay stagnation, and the general cost of living, I expect that this 40% figure that believes that they can't ever own a home, this figure may go up. And I mean, look at this chart here. This is the non-housing debt balance chart where we can see that things are spiraling out of control, such as student loans, credit card debt, and auto loans. Because these balances compound in the background against the borrower, this is a structural issue that is going to weaken housing demand in the future. See here that all types of consumer debt are experiencing delinquency lifts across the board. This is from the New York Fed, mortgage debt, auto loan debt, and especially credit card debt. Notice that more than 6% of all credit card debt is now delinquent. This is a 50% increase from one year previously. The rate of increase is not a joke and should be taken very seriously because if these trends continue, I think that the US home ownership rate has likely peaked and this figure will actually fall in the years ahead. However, and this is a big however, just because the home ownership rate is likely to fall, and most renters can't afford housing, this doesn't mean that housing prices at the national level are going to plummet. This is because the other side of the equation is holding up the housing market, and that is supply. So let's talk about the supply side of the equation that is holding up housing. The supply side equation is held up by three groups, in my opinion, home builders, investors, and baby boomers. We'll talk about all three. Now I want to make it perfectly clear that if supply continues to remain as tight as it is, housing prices can actually still go up on a national level, but not for the reasons you might think. And if supply were to fall, then housing prices are built on a foundation of sand because the housing market is not yet at levels which are affordable, as I talked about earlier, and they can't absorb all the supply that comes into the market if supply opens up. The first issue in the housing market is the composition of buyers within the market. We can see from this Redfin analysis that investors now own an unbelievable 26% of low-priced homes in this market, the exact market that first-time homeowners are hoping to enter in. They also own about one-sixth to one-seventh of the entire mid-market and high-end homes, which is a considerable percentage. With the upcoming Fed pivot, which is still in debate, any lowering of interest rates could lower cap rates in real estate to be more attractive relative to the 10-year treasury, and this could create a mad dash of real estate investors to buy homes due to cheaper access to capital. Because investors own such a large percentage of housing supply, their activity is likely pegged to the future of rates. Investors will typically be in buying mode when rates come down, and because rates will eventually come down, even if the Fed pivot is longer than expected, this group most likely has a buyer's mindset 
in the coming six to 12 months, which could keep supply tight. The second source of supply problems comes from home builders. I have to ask you an interesting question. Do you notice that there are a lot of new apartments being built in your neighborhood? Do you also notice that there aren't a lot of new single family homes being built? Well, this question was floated on popular online forums such as Reddit, and it's a very good question. It's a very valid question. This is because the situation is actually deliberate. Home builders have essentially reprioritized their capital spending towards apartment building development rather than single family homes. Home builders have done the math and they have concluded that it's far more profitable to create tall apartment buildings which offer them significant recurring rental income from being able to house more people in the same land square footage compared to building single family homes which does not offer them the same level of recurring income and also profitability. Home builders also know that the statistic of 40% of renters not being able to afford a home will actually allow them to have a very large indefinite group of customers that will keep paying them rent year after year. For this reason, without incentives for home builders to build new single family homes, it's likely that the supply of homes will stay tight and house prices will stay elevated because most of the transactions are taking place in the existing home market. If we're talking about new homes, we can see that new home prices, newly constructed houses, have actually fallen 7% in price. So if home builders build more new homes and these new home prices are already falling, they know that they'll add pressure onto this market and why would they do that? So they won't and they won't build further and that will keep supply artificially low and prices for existing homes stubbornly high. Not because the economy is strong, not because there's a lot of demand for housing, but because of this supply constraint. Now, before we get into the final reason that holds up supply, I want to introduce the partner of today's video, Moomoo. Moo. Let's talk about Moomoo. Moo. Moomoo Moo now offers an impressive 5.1% APY plus an extra 3% APY on its brokerage for your uninvested cash. Its interest is 20 times that of TD, and this is one of the highest interest rates I've seen in the industry. At the same time, it also has many professional functions to help you discover investment opportunities that can bring returns. Now is the US stock market earnings season. You can use the Moomoo earnings calendar to subscribe to the earnings date, times of popular stocks such as Apple and Tesla as soon as possible. You can also view their financial data on Moomoo so you will not miss any opportunity for good financial reports or rising stocks. You can even use Moomoo's trailing stop order to control losses while locking in more profits. The most important thing is that all these functions are part of the app and they're free. What I love about Moomoo is that it stands out by offering zero commissions and no platform fees for stocks, options, and ETFs. Unlike other apps, it's packed with powerful market analysis features, absolutely free, no hidden fees, no minimum deposit required, or no account management fees. You can tap into pro-level tools information absolutely free of charge. Sign up using my link below and grab up to 15 free stocks and Parker Idle Finds on Moomoo for a sweet 5.1% APY plus 3% APY extra, or earn up to $5,000 in cash rewards when you transfer assets to Moomoo. Now the final reason that existing home prices are so high is that the largest set of owners outside of investors are baby boomers and with 35% market share of large homes in the US, they are single-handedly keeping prices high by not moving or downsizing their homes. Their activity or lack of it can determine whether the housing market has more supply of homes for sale outside of investor activity. We can see in this chart that baby boomers and Gen X essentially own the majority of three bedroom homes in the US. With a median net worth of over $400,000, boomers are in a much stronger financial position to withstand housing market and stock market volatility. Therefore, they have a stronger hand than Gen X and millennials even if the unemployment rate were to go up or inflation were to worsen. So here's what I'm watching for the cracks in the housing market to get larger. Right now, these problems are brewing but they aren't forcing immediate change in the housing market. I'm watching the unemployment rate. This is because rising property taxes, which have climbed to more than $4,000 a year, as well as home maintenance fees, which have risen to $6,000 a year, can put pressure on homeowners in the Gen X and millennial age cohort if a $10,000 yearly bill to maintain the home forces them to downsize. I'm also watching homeowner insurance prices and their trends. 
This is really key because home and auto insurance companies like Allstate, State Farm, and Geico, they've all been hit very hard by a string of bad storms and weather events across the U.S. And so they have essentially raised homeowner insurance prices across the board to help them cover their losses. Some of these increases have been very abrupt, double-digit increases that are putting significant strain on homeowners. Being a homeowner has a lot of costs associated with it. Just because the price of the home is going up, homeowners still have a lot of cash outflows to maintain the house itself. Here, literally, climate change has destabilized the insurance business model, and they've had to raise premiums to make up for this increased risk, which is making home ownership and maintaining it more expensive. For climate-affected areas like California, the insurance increases for some neighborhoods have been out of control figures such as 20, 30 percent compared to the previous year. Yes, in just 12 months. Such high insurance premiums and high maintenance costs make certain pockets of real estate neighborhoods in the U.S. even more illiquid than they are today because fewer people will want to buy these houses that come with all this additional baggage. On the other hand, homeowners in such neighborhoods may get so frustrated by these high insurance costs and property taxes that they might sell their homes. But without existing demand for such homes in certain neighborhoods, asking prices would likely have to fall quite a bit to attract buyers. But here's the good news. At least homes in the U.S. are still rising on paper. Because for our friends up north in Canada, their home prices look like they have peaked. See here that they're down 14% from their peak at the national level, and now they're even below their September 2021 prices. So if you're in the U.S., you have it quite lucky because of the dynamics that I just talked about above. Our friends up north, Canadians, actually have suffered through a huge housing correction. Now one thing is for sure. The housing market affordability is going to get even crazier once the Fed pivots. So we're in for a wild ride. Hope you enjoyed the video. Leave a like if you enjoyed. Make sure to join me on Substack. Thank you to Mumu. Have a great day, and I'll see you next time.